Hi, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another conference of the Center of Studies for Contemporary Architecture from Vitella University. Uh, this evening we are having the good evening, a conference Welcome. part of the of the cycle adjacencies. Um, that the, the the idea of this cycle is to to, to have um, to explore different techniques that even working from within architecture uh, discipline uh, by their own nature they and their, and their capacities they, that they convey they, they expand architecture's specificity so um, we're interested in these uh, new architectural modalities that arise from uh, within uh, the new techniques from the incorporation of uh, new techniques and um, the idea of, of the cycle is that a professor of the of the school, in this case Trevor Fat, um, he is professor of an option studio and uh, a studio as well, uh, invites a, a guest and and that they hold a, a conversation regarding this subject and the relationship, uh, potential relationship with their, his own agenda. So. Uh, tonight we are having Shin Koseki. We are very glad to have him here, and I will leave you now with uh, Trevor Pat that uh, will be introducing him and and then having a conversation at, at the end. So thank you. See you later, Trevor. Okay. Um... Yeah, I'm very glad to be able to welcome Shin in to speak today. Um, Shin was actually a colleague of mine in the doctoral program in Switzerland at the EPFL. Uh, a very prolific, uh, engaged colleague and researcher. Um, always involved with the doctoral program uh, and uh, always impressed by the number of things he managed to accomplish in his time there. Um, he's continued that. Um, I think in the theme of the adjacencies is a great example uh, for the really the wide inter interdisciplinary spaces that architects are increasingly occupying. Um, a short introduction, he is a city scientist, an urban studies scholar, a policymaker, an urban designer and urban planner, uh, a coder, has a background in architecture, uh, but also spatial planning, geography and data science. Um, He's the co-founder of a Paris-based urban planning cooperative called Koros. He's worked on urban plans, but also national, even transnational plans um, in Switzerland, France, uh, his native Canada. <clears throat> and these plans are, um, I think, also quite wide ranging, um, working to promote economic and ecological sustainability, to increase accessibility and participation and empowerment uh, of the citizenry. Um, a particularly unique element of his research, I think, is the study of the production of moral and social value in cities. Um, besides the aforementioned Koros, Shin is also the scientific coordinator of the Digital Humanities Lab at EPFL. Uh, he sits on the Habitat Research Center Executive Committee there, and he serves on the IEE AI Synergy Committee. Um, and so he's a very, very interesting uh, combination of um, you know very classical uh, urban social values and uh, also the kind of uh, very future looking um, uh, and, and aware um, tech aware uh, direction that the that city planning is actually increasingly moving in and um, Re reacting to or even being driven by. Um, as Manuel mentioned, um, the adjacencies series is linked to uh, usually one of the courses, uh, seminars being offered. I'm teaching a class called Maps and Patterns this semester. And um, the work that we've done in that, uh, engaged with urban mapping, has generally been very speculative uh, and to some degree very abstract um, in terms of graphic conveying a meaning in the construction of maps. And um, one of the things I think we can really appreciate in the work we'll see here tonight, uh, for my students at least, is this engagement with a very real and tangible politics and a, an advocacy for, uh, for
for real world policies and the, the grounding that that gives as well. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Shin and um, uh, let him begin. Sorry, thank you very much, Trevor. Uh, thank you, Manuel, for, um, for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be here with you tonight. It's uh, actually one, uh, sorry, midnight in Switzerland. Uh, so please excuse me if I give this entire lecture in English. Uh, in this talk, I will be presenting some of the work I did a few years back in mapping the evolution of political landscape in Switzerland. And this work was part of a larger research that I did on the effects of urbanization on political and moral values and an ongoing interest that I have on the intersect of values in urban space. So let me just share my screen. It says that host disabled attendees share, sorry, host disabled attendee screen sharing. So I think you have to make me host to let me share my screen. Right, okay, good. So as an urban planner and an architect, I've been working on the notion of values for about 11 years, all the way back to my master's in architecture. And the more I study values, the more I believe that the intersection of values in urban space is a powerful tool to understand and to design better cities for inhabitants. And this is a very good example of what I, what I mean. When I say, uh, you know, understand and designing better cities and territories for inhabitants, it might actually resonate with you and you can agree or disagree. But basically, this is a very good example of the type of value charged phrases or words that we use today in urban planning practice and research uh, to build on the urban discourse. And I would say there's two ongoing situations that you are familiar with, which are very good examples of how values intersect in urban space. The first one is the spread of the COVID SARS-19 uh, virus in the human population, which departed from China and which has triggered a global political as well as economical crisis. The second one is the global anti-racism protest movement, which has departed from the US and has also spread in the human population to trigger a global political and moral crisis. Now, these two situations uh, are often described in the media through three different themes, globalization, urbanization, and inequalities. And in more spatial words, we could say connectivity, accessibility, and distributions. And because these words are inherently spatial, I believe that architects and urban planners have the capacity to act onto the world and to address these situations with the help of social, economical, and political actors. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not saying that racism is a virus and I'm not comparing the dreadful historical damages of uh, systemic racism to the many thousands of deaths of the pandemic. There are very different situations that describe the diffusion of ideas and knowledge within society, and therefore can be explained or at least analyzed through the lens of uh, spatial analysis basing, um, based on the interspatial relationship between different places. And in order to do this, we can use three basic concepts, which are co-presence, telecommunication, and mobility. These three social technologies can also be used to describe how urban space shapes or forges values. Values manifest in many ways in spatial design and across architecture and urban planning, we've seen that values play a central role in the discourse on the built environment. One of the very good examples and very early examples of this is Le Corbusier, who in the Radiant City described the ideal society and the architectural and planning means to reach it. The, the Radiant City is actually not one of the most famous work of Le Corbusier, but if you read uh, towards an architecture or if you read urbanism, you will see that most of the concept, the moral political concept that Le Corbusier put forward in the Radiant Cities are being reused in these letter works. We can actually trace back most of these concepts to the French Enlightenment and mostly to the work of Jean-Jacques Rousseau and the Comte de Saint-Simon, who in the 19th, or sorry, in the 18th century actually laid the ground for 
what we call social and economical naturalism. Today, we find comparable value discourses in contemporary spatial design and research. Uh, notions of openness, accessibility, common grounds, equity, justice, inclusion, viability, and so on, are examples of value charge words, words used by architects and urban planners to think the city. In urban settings, these new values collide with those of the modernist movement of Le Corbusier, which were about hierarchy, power, organization, and rationality. Now, I have two questions. Sorry, I have two questions for you, uh, just for yourself, so you don't have to answer this, of course. But I will let you maybe 10 to 15 seconds to think about it. So the first question I have is how do you think your values influence your design? And then the second question I have is how do you think your design can actually change people's value? The reason I ask this question is because a lot of research has shown that spatial configuration and social configuration in space tend to orient people's values uh, and population's values overwhelmingly. So before I present the maps uh, that I'm supposed to present on the effect of urbanization on political values in Switzerland, I would like to tell you a bit more about what exactly I mean by value and trace back with you how values are tightly bound to uh, urban space thinking. The most common way we've been describing values in relation to urban planning and design, and it's basically how I also got interested in the topic, is in terms of economical values. In fact, the necessity to understand why and how cities created economical values, mainly in relation to rent, but also to real estate and production, was one of the first topic of urban planning research and practice. Early examples of this were Cristaller's central place theory, which aimed at understanding the urbanization patterns in function of the distance between cities and the size of cities. And for this, Chris Teller actually looked at uh, the um, urbanization patterns you could find in Southern Germany. Today, we can say that the study of how urbanization and globalization afford greater economical values to certain places is central to urban planning practices in theory and a big condition to architectural design and urban design. Now, social values have been the center of urban studies to, since the end of the 19th century with the work of Jörg Zimmel, who in 1903 published The um, Metropolis and the Mental Life, in which he suggested that urban and rural contexts fostered different values because of the type of social and spatial relationship that they allowed. And this theory was later uh, reused by people in the Chicago School and the subcultural theory movement all pointing out to, the, to, the, to Zimmel's original theory that city living induced specific types of values. Today, we actually recognize this theory under different names. It can be called cityism, urbanness, urbanity, cosmo, cosmopolitanism, for example. And all these theories uh, basically highlight how um, spatial context and spatial configuration have an effect on individual and collective value systems. And here again, uh, we see that globalization, urbanization, and inequalities constitute the main explanation schemes of these theories. So what are political values? Well, we often describe political values in terms of these basic forms of values, economic values and social values. This is why when we talk about politics, political parties or uh, elections, we often will describe them in terms of their location on the right, left, or liberal conservative axis. And in the last 20 years, what we've seen is that there's an emergence of a new form of political positions, mostly um, between environmentalism or environmental ideology and productivist ideologies. But what I will show is that we've also seen another type of new um, division in political values, which is mostly spatial and occurring between cities and the countryside. So how do political values evolve through space and time? 
So here's an example of a recent political election in the US. So this is Donald Trump's um, election in 2016, where he was running oppose Hillary Clinton. And in the center, what you see is a cartogram. So a cartogram is a map where the area is actually proportional to the size of the population rather than to the size of the, of the land. Right above the cartogram, you actually see a, reg a regular map, a corporate map with the same data. And when we look at these maps, they tell a different story, right? So the, the map above shows that most, you know, most of the US voted for Donald Trump, or at least most areas voted for Donald Trump. And in the central map, what we see is that most people voted for Hillary Clinton. And it's not anybody, it's basically people who live in larger urban centers, cities like New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Detroit, Miami, who voted for Hillary Clinton. And uh, Trump found most of his support in uh, suburban and rural areas. This pattern, we actually see it occur in different contexts. So here again are three cartograms of uh, recent elections or recent votes that occurred in Western Europe. So on the left, we have the vote for the, um, the leave of the European Union uh, in the UK, right? And what we see is that there's this stringent contrast between votes in large urban centers like London, Manchester, and Liverpool uh, against people voting in the countryside and the suburbs. Of course, there's a few exceptions. For example, there's a few cities in the UK that supported the, the leave. And you have regions like Scotland and most of Ireland, which actually supported the, the, the Remain. On the top right side, you have uh, the most recent election in Austria. And again, you see how people in Wien and other large cities in Austria voted for one candidate and people living in other parts of the country voted for the other candidate. And finally, the most recent presidential election in France opposing Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen, where people living in large cities like Paris, Lyon, Bordeaux, Marseille voted mostly for Macron, and people living in the suburbs and in the countryside mostly voted for Marine Le Pen. The problem with using election maps and election data in studying political polarization and political values is basically the fact that elections are a very complex system. So it's very hard to identify why people voted for one candidate or another. And this is why Switzerland is actually a very good case study uh, to do this kind of research. So some of you might know Switzerland uh, as a very small landlocked country in the center of Europe. It's also famous for its banks, its chocolates and its gold. Uh, but two things make Switzerland especially interesting to study how urbanization impacts values. Well, first, it has an historically very diverse national composition, meaning that there's four linguistic groups that compose a national population, German speakers, Italian speakers, French speakers, and Roman speakers. And there's two dominant Christian denominations. They're the Catholics and the Protestants. And what's interesting is that these populations, contrary to other countries where uh, linguistic regions and religious regions are usually overlapping. In Switzerland, you have French-speaking Catholics, French-speaking Protestants, German-speaking Catholics, German-speaking Protestants, and so on. The other reason why it's interesting to use Switzerland as a case study is because of the direct democratic system, which is quite unique in the world. So in Switzerland, uh, people don't just elect you know, president and representative, they actually vote on most laws, right? So they will actually gather four times a year and vote on different laws at the federal, regional, and municipal level. And these laws can cover any topic from immigration to economics, to healthcare, um, social issues, uh, and even the construction of large infrastructures. This is one of the example of a votation that occurred in 2014, which became quite famous because Switzerland, before the UK, uh, even though it was never in the European Union, actually decided to um, um, cancel out its bilateral agreement with the European Union. And if we look at the regular map of Switzerland, so this is a regular map of Switzerland, here we have the Italian speaking part, the German speaking part is more or less here, and the French speaking part is more or less here. We see these kind of like regional divides between uh, the lot of support for this vote in the Italian speaking part and then in uh, places in central Switzerland, for example. 
But when we look at the map, at the current blood map, what we see is that there's a very stringent contrast between cities uh, like Zurich, Bal, Bern, Lausanne, and Geneva, which mostly voted against uh, this new regulation. So they wanted to remain with um, in good agreements with Europe. While people who lived in the countryside in the suburbs mostly voted uh, for this regulation. Now, the cities I'm gonna present, basically my goal was to, um, to check how local communities shared political values and how these values evolved through times. Uh, for this, I was only able to go back to 1981 because this is when we started collecting the data. And the idea was to look at what's the political landscape among Swiss local populations. So I analyzed 300 federal votes since 1981, uh, which concerned 3,200 municipal, municipal populations. And these votes cover all aspects of life, security, environment, health, economy, and so on. So we can all really go into detail with every theme and look at what kind of, you know, what kind of uh, political landscape each of these themes create. Of course, I was not the first person to conduct this kind of analysis. Before me, there was people doing what we call multivariate analysis, but these have many limitations, mostly statistical and empirical limitations. Uh, for example, they don't allow for dynamic analysis. They're, they don't afford a robust measure, and it's very difficult to import the result from multivariate analysis into other fields or even into urban planning and design. So instead, I created my own method by um, combining network theory or uh, social network analysis and importing a measure of political agreement disagreement. So with this method, I was able to um, map out the evolution of the political landscape in Switzerland, basing uh, or creating actually 6 billion uh, measure of uh, political agreement disagreement. And so there's of course many statistical technical scientific advantages to using this method. It controls for agreement by chance. It's, it expresses agreement from disagreement, which is quite important if you're interested in studying polarization, for example. It affords a value space of minus one to zero and from zero to one uh, with an internal measure for real um, reliance, which means that basically, if you don't have enough data, the measure will tell you so. It accepts missing data, which is a very big deal in uh, data science. And it's also stable across different numbers of observers. So even if you have missing data, or even if you're doing the analysis on uh, very few uh, entities or very few municipalities, the result remain reliable. And so looking at agreement and disagreement between all the, all the local population in Switzerland. So on the left, you have um, what I would call a full agreement network or full agreement model. So imagine that all the population form the circle and then the lines between every population is basically how much they agree on political issues, right? And on the right, you have the distribution of these values. And what we see is that most population tend to agree, which is normal because politics remain a rational um, process. But we also see that a very few of these people tend to engage in what we call ideological consensus, meaning that they basically agree on almost everything. They are very alike. We also find a very few people here uh, that systematically disagree with one another. And that's also very interesting, right? Because uh, in a sense, it shouldn't happen in regular politics. The interest of using this method is also because we can represent the, the outcome data both as cartographic maps, but also as networks. And here's a depiction of the network evolution between 1981 and 2015, which is the period for which I analyze the data. And we really see the evolution of this network. Here, the colors represent the linguistic region. So in the 1980s, 1990s, we see this kind of clear division between linguistic regions. So population in, in different linguistic regions voted differently from one another. And as we advance in the, the years 2000 and 2015, 2010, we see that there's a convergence, right? So like there's less and less polarization within the country, but also linguistic regions are becoming less and less uh, opposed to one another. We can also 
um, project this data onto a cartogram. So here is a slightly different cartogram that we made with our lab. Um, the difference I will tell you is it's a differentiated cartogram, which means that in Switzerland, because there's a lot of mountains, there's a lot of areas which is uninhabited. And here they are in gray. And uh, by fixing this uninhabited places on the map, it gives you a much more readable outcome of the map. You can even see like the little valleys. So you can guess more easily what areas are being represented. So again, here, the idea is that the size of the area is proportional to the size of the population. That's why Zurich and Geneva's are so big. And so what do we see? Well, we see that in the 80s, uh, the country was quite you know, uh, divided in a lot of different re political regions, a lot of different political intentions, right? Most of them were regionalized. For example, in the Italian speaking part of the country is all or more or less all uh, green. But in some and other parts of the country, we see much more colors, which indicate that uh, even locally, there was a lot of, of uh, political um, disagreement between local communities. And then in the 1990s, we see that there's a homogenization of political preferences within linguistic regions. So again, we have the Italian speaking part of the country and then the German speaking part of the country, the French speaking part of the country, which all start to become more and more alike. But what's really interesting, it's what happens right after. So in the years 2000 and later on, what we see is a total shift in the political alignment of local populations. For example, here uh, we have the city of Zurich, which aligns with uh, the city of Bern, but also aligns politically with a lot of different little towns in the French speaking part of the country. Likewise, we have the Italian speaking part of the country, which aligns politically with Geneva, Lausanne and uh, the Jura. So Switzerland, which has been historically known for its kind of like division on linguistic regions is becoming quite different. We see that regions that used to be, or that are uh, physically quite distant from one another start to align politically with one another. And this, this is happening exactly more or less when uh, we, with the introduction of the internet, for example, and uh, the increase uh, traveling throughout the country for work or for leisure. And then finally, what's happened in the last decade is a clear separation in three categories. So we have on one hand, large German speaking cities like Zurich, uh, Winterthur, St. Gallen, Basel, Bern. So all of these are German speaking uh, cities of different religion. Uh, which align with the Italian speaking part of the country, which was historically known for being very conservative and with the French speaking part of the country. And those oppose the German speaking suburbs and the German speaking countryside. Now with this method, we can also look more into detail to each and every one of these uh, populations. So I won't do this. I, won't, I will only give you one example with Zurich. So this is a network representing all the population that tend to agree the most with Zurich, right? So here on the right side. And we can again, project this data onto a regular map or a corporate map. Here it's a regular map that shows which populations tend to agree the most with Zurich. And we see that the population that agree the most with Zurich, which is here, are urban populations, again, of Winterthur, Zengalen, Basel, and Bern. We also see population that disagree the most with Zurich. And this is also what's interesting. So you have two little towns here, which are not so far from Zurich. It's actually one hour uh, by train or 45 minutes by car uh, that systematically vote opposite to what people in Zurich vote. And this is what these places look like. So on the left side, we have Zurich, which is the biggest city in Switzerland. And then on the right side, side we have Mutotal, which is uh, you know, not a very, very, it's not a village, it's a small city somewhere in the Alps. And it's quite known for being one of the most conservative place in Switzerland. And actually, if we look at which political parties these different places vote for, here we have a visualization that was made uh, last year actually by the New York Times in which they located all the political parties in Western Europe and North America along this left right axis. And people in Zurich tend to vote for the Swiss Green Party and the Swiss Social, Social Party, which 
are among the most left parties in Western Europe and North America. While people in Mutatal tend to vote for the Swiss People's Party, the Schweizer Volkspartei, which is to be the most right-wing party in Western Europe and North America. So just to summarize, how values intersect in urban space? Well, we see that there's three factors that tend to explain this uh, relationship between values and urban space, which is urbanization, globalization, and distribution. I also briefly mentioned these three spatial mechanism that can explain the diffusion of values in urban space. Co-presence, the fact of being together, mobility, the fact of you know, coming from one place to the other, and then telecommunication, which is basically what we're doing right now. We said that values produce urban design and planning projects, mostly uh, in the modernist, modernist movement, as well as today. We also saw that there's many forms of values. There's economical values, social and political values. And finally, the study that I did showed that there's an increasing political divide along the urban rural context. So to understand how values intersect in urban space allows us to act directly onto the world. And as designers, I think we have the capacity, but we also have the duty to create a better world and to design better cities and territories that empower inhabitants. And how can we design, uh, how can design empower inhabitants? And I will finish on this. Well, design can empower inhabitants by focusing on their citizenship, by carefully assessing and understanding their aspirations, by defin defining capabilities that would help them actualize these aspirations, but mostly by designing environments that afford the social and material resources they need to do so. These affordances may be building, places, events, landscape. They can also be maps, research, and stories that help citizens to make better decisions and mitigate the risk. Social, economical, and ecological transition can only happen with the help of people. And I believe that our role as designers is merely to help them achieve what they want for themselves. So all of the material that I presented today will be online shortly uh, on my website. Also, please reach out to me if you have any question on Twitter, here's my handle. Thank you very much. Ah, okay, I'm back. <laughs> All right, uh, great. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that. I um, I think I haven't even seen the, the detailed presentation of that um, that work before. So I, I really I really enjoyed it. Um, we're going to have the uh, chat window on Zoom open for questions to submit uh, from people who are listening and who have joined in on the, uh, from the Tele community. Um, to start off, I'd probably just ask a few questions of my own. Um, sure. If you don't mind, we see how long we go. Manuel, you can keep time on us. <clears throat> um, I, what I really enjoyed about the about this project, this research project, um, is that you produced this map that has, um, you know, some really lovely map cartographic qualities, right? Um, and uh, and thought, uh, the colors, um, incredibly legible. I I love this addition of the kind of decimetric tendencies where you're kind of leaving the mountains in place but removing them from the from the data in a sense i think the legibility of that is just compared to the the cartograms you showed um from other sources of the u.s selection all was completely illegible or the uk uh, vienna the austria just this the distortion is so uh, intense um but at the same time it's not only a map it seems it's also a a, a model in all of the things that that implies in the, uh, as, a, as a digital model that it has 
a rigorous logic, other functions behind it, and even potential usages, right? That you can dig into that data um, and show things that a map on its own would never would never accomplish. I think, right? Like it has the forward facing and then the kind of the back face. That's just a compliment, not a question. <laughs> um, Thanks. But uh, so the question, I guess, is um, it to me? It seems like you have a very uh, a very strong optimism for the role that technology and data, and even particularly big data, um, can play uh, for a variety of disciplines, but particularly for planners, uh, spatial planners, and designers. Um, but I don't know that I would classify you as a technocrat per se. So <laughs> I wonder if you could just expand maybe a little on, on how you see um, either that, how you view your own optimism or how you uh, place it in the kind of other context of maybe data privacy, data fears, and the, the kind of um, worry that, you know, algorithms have taken over the world. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna give you a very political answer here. Uh, the reason is I've been myself involved in a lot of different act actions or activities relating to the governance and regulation of data and of data privacy, uh, mostly in relation to AI, for example. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I mean, of course that's my own word, so you have to trust me here, but I have to say that the people that I see working in this field are genuinely preoccupied by the impact that AI or you know uh, big data can have on people's life, and you know working with people at Google AI even or Facebook or you know there's a lot of people of course at the MIT who work with this kind of data, you can see how careful they are in mm. securing the data and in making sure that um, you know their work doesn't have any negative impact and actually they actively work towards making algorithm more safe and algorithm more just, uh, this, is, this is a very big topic right now in research, in academic research. How do we make fair algorithms, for example? How do we make algorithms that are more fair towards you know, minorities or people who historically have been um, you know, oppressed, such as you know, racialized people or women, uh, elder, peop elder people also. And so um, I don't think that anybody has a bad agenda in a sense, right? Or at least I haven't met them yet. <laughs> I think the bad agenda might just happen when people have, you know, they have one goal and they won't be too cautious about what's happened, you know, to other people, right? But nobody mm. willfully will do something wrong. And there's so many, um, so many of these really, really generous people who believe that we can create a better society through big data and through uh, AI and algorithms, um, that makes me believe that uh, it, is, it is achievable. Mm -hmm. um, it's an interesting uh, topic. It's a little off the topic of the day, um, but just a few weeks ago, we had um, a lecture also by Neil Leach and he talked on the subject of AI, primarily from the design potential um, and what it was doing with visual kind of graphic neural nets and that sort of um, mm. that sort of domain. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I would guess that the AI domain which you're working in and looking at more often is a, a kind of distinct field from that. Right, right. I mostly work, uh, I mean, so for the last two years, I've been organizing this conference called Cities in AI. So it's basically gathering people from, uh, you know, researchers, there's city officials and politicians, there's uh, companies coming together, discussing what are the opportunities and limitations of AI applied mostly to urban governance and planning. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think the, the approach is quite different, but then if, you know, when you enter these kind of like circle, you start understanding that the, the preoccupations remain very similar. You know, mm -hmm. AI is a very powerful technology, but it's also a very, I mean, sounds a bit weird, but it's a very simple technology, right? It does mm -hmm. one thing. AI usually mm -hmm. does one thing at a time. So it's not mm -hmm. so intelligent, right? It's actually quite dumb. 
Um, and so wherever you apply it, the principles remain always the same mm -hmm. in terms of what you can do with it, but also in terms of how you can be careful about uh, what are the risks associated with it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, it, yeah, it does sound like it definitely an increased potential for risk. Um, as you said, like in the first side, the, the dangers come when there's a kind of reduction of the application of data to a, a single end. Mm. And that there maybe is a, a sense that AI is in its single-mindedness of any particular AI method or model. Um, yeah, that it, it incentivizes that kind of narrow, narrow uh, mm -hmm. vision, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the the um, the whole, the entire field, I think, of of AI, but also digital humanities, because you're quite involved there. Um, I find it very always well i find it always a, a tricky um subject that you get very excited about something and then maybe discouraged uh when you find out maybe how far from from architectural design or spatial design maybe some of these things still are so with neil leach i was asking him quite a bit about uh maybe the bias towards imagery and the 2D methods that were being used. Um, digital humanities in its origins was always very text-based, mm. um, going through huge corpus, through um, um, scanning, but also then kind of natural language processing and things like that. Um, the, the DH lab at EPFL though, even when it began, I remember it started with an urban project at least right. a historical urban project in Venice. Yes, Do exactly. you see, is that a, uh, it's still in a part of the agenda of the Digital Humanities Lab? Are you promoting? I think it is, yes, I think it projects? is. And I think, yeah, I think it is. I think it's not just specific to the one in EPFL. I think this is mm -hmm. something that's happening uh, in a lot of different contexts. And the reason I see this is because if we look back at the evolution of what I call um, digital ecosystems, right? So environments in which there's a abundance of data, for example, mm -hmm. which started mm -hmm. in the 1970s mm -hmm. with the digitalization of a lot of material from uh, companies and governments has now transferred to uh, the urban context, right? So mm -hmm. the digital traces that we live uh, behind us, you know, in daily life, for example, the kind of spatialized this, data, this, ur exactly, this urban mm -hmm. digital context. And what's mm -hmm. so um, powerful with the urban context is that when you work with data, one of the big challenge is to uh, be able to actually relate them to one another, right? So this idea mm -hmm. of, of using uh, multiple types of data, so multi multimodal data approach, for example. And one of the very few characteristics which is common to almost any data not all of the data, but a lot of data is space. Mm. Almost mm. all of the data, mm. all of the thing that we can put into data is somewhere, right? It can be right. in physical space, it can be a virtual space, but it is still a space. And we can mm. always uh, relate any sets of data in relation to where they're located uh, in relation to each other, for example. So this is why I believe that, um, you know, the idea of engaging digital humanities toward you know, urban context, for example, is actually just uh, the start. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's that's really um, fascinating to hear you say. Something about that just clicked with, you know, things that I've always said to my students doing doing workshops that um, you don't need actually a lot of data to begin with in a model or in a, a site analysis or anything like that because actually putting it onto the map, putting it into the site generates again through the spatialization another set of relationships and connections yeah. and then just working even with that kind of um, secondary second tier or subsequent data um, gives you so much to work with in fact um, okay <laughs> i'll follow up with that in a second we've got a, a question coming in from the the chat um mm -hmm. 
I think you can see it as well, probably, but I'll read it out loud. Yeah. Um, so Shin, um, have you used collective maps in your analyses, um, self-produced by ordinary people? So I guess in the sense of like um, the way Kevin right. Lynch, for example, would collect for image of the city uh, to detect their implicit values um, because potentially the origin of the process information could influence the reading of the urban values. Right, so thanks uh, Martin for uh, the question. Uh, yes, actually I did. Part of my PG actually I was conducting comparative fieldwork between Geneva and Singapore. And in both cases, we were actually mapping out uh, physically. I mean, you know, me and my, sorry, I was doing interviews, right? So uh, I was interviewing mostly younger people in Singapore and Geneva, comparing how they relate uh, their daily, weekly, monthly, yearly spatial practices to different sets of values and mostly to uh, their friends and their family, right? And trying to understand what was the relationship between distance and uh, core value. And just mm. to give you an example, I had like one person I interviewed in Singapore who was telling me how much they love their grandmother. And then when I asked them where they live, um, sorry, the person told me that they hadn't seen their grandmother for at least a year or so. And when I asked them where they lived, they actually lived down the street, right? So there's this kind of like, uh, you know, when you ask, start asking these questions and put, putting them into space, I mean, I think mm, if, mm, if mm -hmm. I were a sociologist, I would just have asked this and then I wouldn't have realized how uh, contradictory this is. But mm. with mapping, um, you know, these people daily spatial practices with them, was a very interesting way to produce this, um, you know, to make these values emerge out of their discourse, mm. for example. So I hope I answered the question, but- uh, No, I think it's, I it's interesting. Self-produced maps. <laughs> Self-produced maps, yeah. Because uh, it's true in Singapore, the, the commute from east to west side is almost uh, introversible. It's mentally farther apart than, than the, Lausanne Zurich train, which I feel like uh, in the Swiss mindset is so ingrained mm -hmm. as it's just, it's there, it's so uh, present. It's like a metro line virtually the way that people consider it. And you have your demi terry for you have your abonnement general and you just go and it's not even really uh, uh, thought about. Um, mm -hmm. I think the, the, um, the second part of that, the kind of the origin of the process information influencing the reading is also interesting. One of the things that I notice in, um, in your Swiss maps is that there's such a small fine grain of municipalities mm. and the, the communes. Um, and I think this is always one of the, one of the challenges of, of that kind of uh, sociological mapping in the U.S. is there such a weird uh, divergence of scales and sizes and densities and some very like Los Angeles County mm. is enormous and dense and then you have districts in Manhattan that are invisible on any kind of national map and then you have the very enormous ones that are empty and, and weird small ones that are like an airport and no one lives there. Mm -hmm. um, Do you, I'm not sure there's a question there, but um, do you, how do you feel about, let's say, okay, to ask a question, how do you feel about your method as applied to areas that are less spatially homogenous um, or where the data is less um, evenly distributed maybe than, than the kind of Swiss elections. Right. So, I mean, of course, this is a limitation of the method, right? Uh, especially because, well, Switzerland, as, as I said, Switzerland is a perfect case study for this research because not only you have yeah. these very uh, fine grained locations with a lot of data, you have all these votes, you can really go into depth with them. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also, the fact that, you know, there's a lot of cultural diversity helps trying to understand like how these different patterns evolve mm -hmm. through time. And as but, you said, there's a uh, lot of votes on yes, exactly. so many topics. It's a very yes. direct uh, referendum. 
Exactly. So now uh, one of my projects that I'm doing is trying to adapt the method to different kinds of data sets. And again, mm -hmm. I think in this case, space is a key because as I said before, uh, mm -hmm. what's common to most data set that I'm using, which can be uh, electoral data, vote data, they can be census, can be mm -hmm. surveys. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of different surveys, social value surveys, moral value surveys, and so on uh, going on across the world. And all of this data has to a certain point, some kind of spatial attribute to them, right? Mm. Um, obviously the ultimate goal is to work with individualized data. Uh, so I've been working with people, for example, at the MIT, there's this group called the Human Dynamics and uh, we've been working together trying to analyze the relationship between vote patterns and physical movements between different neighbors, uh, neighborhoods of a city, for example, right? to a point where we try to really uh, associate um, political preferences to individual. I mean, of course, all of this is anonymized and uh, ex extremely secured. Uh, there's no way to trace these people back because the data is actually quite old, right? So it mm. doesn't, um, it's kind of obsolete, but still you can analyze those and uh, better understand what's the relationship between spatial distribution, urbanization, mm. and then the political and moral values of the people. Where is Where are you looking in that uh, research? National so the context? Re yeah, so the research was uh, conducted on uh, Turkey, hmm. Mexico, and uh, we had data for China, but China was a bit difficult because there are local elections, uh, but the political context makes it a bit more difficult to give meaning to the, to the results hmm. or to the, hmm. you know, to the outcome of these elections. Hmm. Um, the um, yeah, the other thing that I, I guess I I imagine is um, I mean, so you've done quite a lot of work on uh, across France and um, in national like type of type of work, and there it seems like there's a very different relationship of the cities where the Swiss is really a kind of conurbation, um, even actually part of a larger conurbation um, through. Uh, Western Germany, but the, perhaps it's more natural that there's a, a urban alliance. Um, what do you find in, in France where the, again, you, like Argentina, you have a dominant capital, mm. um, but then the, the secondary cities are, are maybe, to my understanding anyway, not so much like um, aligned with Paris, uh, let's say in the mental maps of people, people right. from, from Marseille are really Marseille, Marseille is not, uh, you know, part of urban France, perhaps. I mean, this is maybe the question. I mean, um, so our research shows that similar patterns appear also in France. And mm. I think the reason is that even though France is much more centralized in Switzerland because everything happens in Paris and it, there's other large cities, of course, right? But most of the administration and industry mm. is based in Paris. But the way that France functions is that everything is connected back to Paris, right? Mm. So this, this notion of connectivity, I think is the key in how values kind of diffuse in an urban system. Mm. I think this is also mm. why we see some same patterns happening in uh, the UK or in Switzerland or in the US. Um, so it's not the, so much a matter of the hierarchy between the different places, but more a matter of like how these different places are connected and how they are interdependent. So in Switzerland, all the places are more or less on the same level. So their inter interdependence is more or less, you know, all together. They all depend mm -hmm. on each other. Yeah, in France, right, the right. interdependence is all towards Paris, basically. Okay. Yeah, there's a great... Um historical map that we've we've come up in class that um, I'm now forgetting who made it. I was just trying to find it <laughs> name really quickly, but the, the acceleration uh, of oh, voyages the in France between... and the shrinking size yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I saw that. of the I country saw that itself. Map, uh, not, so, not so long ago, actually. It's amazing. I have to find it again. Yeah. Um, it's quite interesting. Yeah. It really, it really does uh, draw that point home because the, <laughs> the, the concentric uh, boundaries of France as, as train travel is speeding up. It really is a, a concentric and it converges on Paris so neatly. And mm -hmm. it's hard to imagine another country where that might be so um, 
graphically, geogra geomet geometrically perfect. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the um, I think the UK is a really interesting question at the moment. Um, having been here through the, the last couple of elections, um, where there was a huge shift in the, the historical voting patterns mm -hmm. that were labor counties voting suddenly Tory and uh, um, the, in terms of the axes that you, um, you were talking about earlier. Oh, I just spotted there's another message. So I'll interrupt my, my question and get to that one. Um, this is getting to uh, um, kind of the architectural side of it. Shin, do you think there's a specifically architectural way of elaborating, articulating, and executing public policies? In other words, what, in other words, what form would a, a, govern, a government take uh, if architecture were the governing party? <laughs> Well, I don't think that architecture should be the governing party. Uh, this is actually, this was the dream of the Corbusier, right? So the Corbusier mm. in, his, uh, in his 20s and 30s um, was a very strong supporter of um, a political system where, you know, people were represented by their professions. Uh, and he wanted to have architects like at the top of the, you know, <laughs> a political pyramid. Um, good thing it didn't happen. Uh, however, I believe that, um, sorry, just to take again the question. Um, okay, yeah. I think that architects, well, you know, there's many ways that architecture and architects can engage with these kind of questions, right? Uh, I think they have a personal responsibility whenever it comes up to design a place, design a building to make sure that their design is inclusive, that their design actually takes into account uh, local population, but also not just local population, but also you know, regional population or and so on. So this is what I mean by aspiration, right? To really take into consideration the aspirations of the people who are likely to be using this space. Um, and it doesn't mean just you know, asking the owners of a house what they want for their house. It means asking you know, a larger share of the, of the of society, what do they want as a territory? What do they want as an environment? What do they want as a social and economical system? And architects, I think, have the capacity and could have the role to translate this aspiration into design, right? And this is something that um, we kind of lost, I think, in the 1970s, 1980s, perhaps, that used to be there, right? Uh, maybe not with the best interpretation, let's say. Um, but I think there's a lot of potential for architects to be more involved with the population and more engaged with the population. Um, and you've, you've done work, I mean, literally in this, uh, in this realm, the actual like planning of public mm -hmm. spaces. And um, do you have any uh, maybe specific things that were, if you would say, architectural strategies or, or techniques, maybe not even architectural, but modes of practice that were uh, especially uh, productive in that sense? Well, um, so currently most of my work concerns uh, planning at a slightly larger scale than public mm -hmm. space, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, and for this, I mean, we're in a very kind of experimental setting where we work with the French Convention on Climate. So it's a event that occurred in France in the last nine months, uh, where 150 citizens were chosen randomly across the entire French population, including, uh, you know, um, territories outside of metropolitan France, so like Guadeloupe mm. and Martinique, for example. And they were uh, asked to define measures to reduce green gas emission for 2030. And what we're doing now is that we're trying to understand what were the motivation behind their measures and to come up with planning strategies and design strategies that would actually both um, make these measures happen, but also take into account questions of you know, local environment, social justice, spatial justice, and so on. Now, when it comes to planning, uh, you know, local 
uh, say small scale public space, let's say. I think there's different ways we can address this. Uh, I've worked, for example, with a Danish uh, architecture office called GEL, and we've done some analysis in Lausanne. So these were mostly based on observation. But again, if we just yeah. start looking around us and looking at how people are using urban space and how people, you know, asking questions about how they would like to use urban space is already engaging towards making public space more accessible to more people. Mm -hmm. There's, there's maybe, um, a, maybe a parallel that could be drawn and uh, this is a hypothesis perhaps um, from some of the things we've talked about so far. Um, with the, the Venice project that the Digital Humanities Lab uh, did that I mentioned earlier, you know, one of the ways into that project was through a kind of digital humanities strength through text processing and reading legends on old maps and records, um, cadastral surveys and things like that and connecting um, these two to places on the map or to to um, locations and maybe in your swiss uh research the one that you just showed there's a way into that by means of network analysis um and the kind of uh all the tools of social network um, modeling uh, that have been developed that gets you to another, like by going through that, it's not the end or the, the, the intention of the project, but going through that, you get around to another way of, of showing, um, uh, re re representing the political spectrum or the, um, the politics of the people, of the, mm -hmm. the race, uh, the race publica. The question is maybe, is there a way to, or is, could you put, could you say that space and urban space is a way through which you can get to, or addressing, not achieving, but addressing um, a kind of public social justice or um, yeah. additional inclusivity and uh, that kind of, as the, as the end goal or the, that, the thing that you're working on, but space being kind of a medium through. Right. Well, um, it's, it's a very interesting question and um, I'm gonna answer very honestly about what I think, which, which may sound a bit weird, but um, <laughs> yeah, I do believe so. And the reason yeah. is that I've always conceived space as a test, you know, space is, a, you know, a dimension of society, which basic, basically you cannot lie to. You cannot lie to space. And everything that happens to, in space is technically spatially logical, right? So in a sense, whenever you try to implement any kind of measures or policy or, uh, you know, design, let's say, in space, space will tell you right away if it works or not, right? Space will not allow you to do something that doesn't work in a sense, right? So yeah, I do believe that space is a very excellent medium to test these kind of ideas because it really shows you if, uh, if combining two sets of data or two ideas or two policies or two measures actually work out or not. Yeah, that's very, that's a compelling thing to, to think about. I think especially um, in, in connection with what you said earlier about how all data is essentially spatialized and um, that even the traditional methods of data are increasingly becoming spatialized because they're, they're being taken from uh, whether they're sensors and IOT things in the field or through mobile tracking um, and that kind of device. Um, I think I've, I've uh, run out of questions, uh, like uh, well-phrased questions anyway. Um, <laughs> they're now all kind of like devolving into hypotheses and um, right. speculations. <laughs> 
Um, I think there's a, there's a, I think you've opened up like a huge um, realm of, of connections to think about, um, especially in the current moment where we're, we are engaging with space in a whole different way. Um, our movements are limited and, and potentially, you know, the contact tracing, track and traces, uh, this kind of spatialized data is take a, a, a more extreme urgency in some sense. Mm. Um, right. I, I, mean, um, I think that, yeah, go ahead. I mean, if I can just uh, comment on this, I think the current situation again is a very good example of how space is central to, um, to, to us as humans, basically. Mm. And I think as, as architects, we often forget this I mean, as architects, we always believe that space is central, right? Uh, but we often forget that other people don't think so because we focus so much on space that we believe that everybody's, you know, everybody's aware of the importance of space. But actually, when you start working outside of architecture, uh, you know, working with digital humanities or with policymakers or with computer engineers, you see how little place space mm -hmm. has in their practice. And again, I think this is something that architecture can really bring to other disciplines, mm -hmm. maybe digital humanities, policymaking, uh, and so on. Um, great. Um, that sounds like a good, a good wrap moment to sentence. conclude on and to wrap up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Shin, thank you um, for making the time um, uh, and and spanning the time zones as well uh, to be here with us. Um, Manuel, have you got a closing sentence? Hi, okay. Thank you, Shin, very much for your conference. Thank you, Trevor, for the conversation. I think it was a very interesting uh, conference and conversation and lots of things to still think about uh, a broad um, specter of, of uh, thoughts was covered. So thank you both. And thank you. Hope, you. hope to see you soon. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.